This is Tom Bain. What is this? This is Wine, Money, and Song. And if you're interested in wine and you want to learn about the best values in wine, please subscribe. In 1855, the government, the agricultural controlling arm in France, decided to classify Bordeaux wines. And it's the famous 1855 classification of Bordeaux wines. And 61 chateaus were put into five tiers of quality. And they were classified by the quality of the wines produced and also the vineyards, the actual sites that were the highest quality that have producing wines year after year, year after year. And if you think about it today, Bordeaux has been making these wines for centuries, not decades. So what they were trying to do was establish an economic base of how much money certain wines should fetch. If you were in the first tier, which is the first growths, you would make, say, take a number 10% more than anything in the second tier. And then the third tier would have 10% less than the second tier and so on down through the fifth tier. So it was there to make economic sense of a, of a crazy market. Uh, so the first growth wines, originally in 1855, they only looked at the left bank wines and they only, and they only classified one grab wine, which is in the southern part, south of Bordeaux. Uh, the rest of the grab wines were not considered, but uh, Aubryon was considered because of its high reputation. So the first four growths, there's five, as you know, but the first four were Chateau Lafitte Rothschild from Pouillac, Chateau Latour, Pouillac, the famous tower, Chateau Aubryon, which is the only grab that was considered because it was south of the, of the what you call the city of Bordeaux. And the fourth was Chateau Margaux. The last, who, who was not included until 1973, Mouton Rothschild Pouillac. It was a second growth until 1973. And through the lobbying and the connections of Eric de Rothschild, after decades of campaigning and lobbying, they were put into the first growth, the first tier, and they became the fifth first growth. So what we're going to try to do today is classify the five great California wines. Why am I doing this? Because I have the nerve to do it, and I think people should look at it and think. And I have the coyotes to do it too. So let's see what I come up with. So picking out the five top California Cabernet-based wines, um, what are the criteria I am using to make these selections? Now, just remember, uh, I've, been, I've been drinking wines and tasting wines um, for almost a half century. And... I really have very, very deep knowledge of Bordeaux and French wines, but when I first got into the business, I cut my teeth on California cabs and California wines. So just about the time that these wines were being introduced, that's when I really got into the wine business. So I've had a lot of these wines and I really love these wines and I have a special place in my heart for uh, California wines. Because this is, you know, that's where I got started and my love of wine started there, even though I got deeply invested emotionally, spiritually, and monetarily in Bordeaux and French wines. My heart is still with California to a, to a great degree. I share it with uh, other wines. So the criteria that we're using for these wines to name them, and I'm going to make some people mad what I leave out and, and maybe what I pick, but... Uh, I'll explain the criteria. First, you had to be a pioneer in the California wine industry. Now, 
prohibition, once prohibition hit, the California industry went away. It didn't exist. And prohibition was like a decade. And when we came out of prohibition, it's a brand new industry. So it took many years until the early 60s before the California wine business started coming back. So you need that history of decades and decades of making high quality wines. And, um, and over time, some of these, some of these estates have gone through periods of mediocrity, like some wines in France did too. It, it like could have been because of economic reasons, uh, weather reasons, but they've come back and overall they have a great long history of high quality wines. Now, the wines I didn't pick, uh, I didn't pick Inglenook, I didn't pick BV, uh, Bolu Vintures, uh, Vineyards, and I didn't pick Robert Mondavi, shockingly, who, who is one of the great pioneers of California wine and the premiumization of California wines and paved the way for all these guys. But he sold his vineyard in... 2000, BV sold their venue to a conglomerate uh, in the 70s and uh, in the 60s. And Inglenook was sold in the early 60s. And Inglenook made some of the greatest, earliest wines. But once they sold out uh, uh, to a large company, Grand Metropolitan Ubline, uh, the wines really went downhill. Francis Ford Coppola now owns it and is trying to restore the Inglenook name and will do that in the future, I'm sure. And BV has been very iffy and Rabba Mandavi since the sale, it's, it's, there's some good wines, but it's not the same. They broke the chain of ownership, so they are not considered. Uh, two of the wines, I had a hard time fit, picking the fifth one and I didn't pick Dunn. Uh, who's been making great wines for decades and decades. Uh, and why I didn't pick Dunn, all of these wines that I picked are very balanced wines. And they're not like a lot of other California wines that are full-blown, a lot of alcohol, a lot of extraction, and a lot of new wood. Uh, most of these are very different. Uh, Dunn, Dunn is such a tannic uh, mountain, you know, uh, mountain grapes comes from, and they're really tannic and he makes great wines, but they take a long time. And I like a little more, uh, elegance to the wines and done wines are not very elegant, uh, unless they have a lot of age. Uh, and another wine I didn't pick was Chapelet. Uh, he was there and he's made some great wines. Uh, the, Chap the Chapelet 1969 Cabernet is a great wine. Uh, and uh, they made, in Pritchett Hill, they made some great wines, but I did not pick them. Maybe he's under the ra radar a little bit. So let me start. The first of the fifth growths is Chateau Montalena. Now, Chateau Montalena started in 1968. Um, and the story about Montalena was, uh, James Barrett was a, uh, in, he was an investment in banking and, um, uh, he was partners with the guy who bought the vineyard Chateau Montalena. They bought it in 1968 and in 1972, James Barrett decided to buy him out. And the reason why he bought out his partner was because it was kind of a tax dodge. He would get big tax deductions for agricultural farming and everything, and he thought it was a great idea. So one summer, his son is work, working at the vineyard, and he's going to college at the same time, and he had no plans on being a farmer, being in the wine business, his son, but his son worked there one summer and said, hey, I can do this. So he started working there in uh, 1972, and... Their claim to fame, Montalena, was not the Cabernet. It was the Chardonnay that finished in first place, the 1973 Chateau Montalena Chardonnay, uh, which got first prize in the Judgment of Paris in 1976. 
And that threw the whole wine world up in a tizzy and it promoted California wines. Uh, but Chateau Montalena is a Cabernet uh, winery. They still make Chardonnay and everything. And that Chardonnay was wonderful and they liked it. But their claim to fame is Cabernet. And they make a very balanced style uh, and for years and years and years, and they're very consistent, very consistent. Uh, Mike Gergich was the first winemaker there, and I think he lasted there five years. And um, once Gergich left, Bo Barrett, uh, uh, who I said his father owned, owned the vineyard, uh, he started making the wine. And he's been involved all along until now. They have a new winemaker, but... Uh, Bo Barrett's wife, Heidi Barrett, is famous for making wines and some of the most famous uh, expensive cult wines in California. But the thing about Montalena, they're not spectacular, but they're very consistent, well-balanced wines, not over oaked. The second wine is Heights Martha Vineyard. And in 1965, that's when Heights began. And 1968, they decided to bottle grapes that they bought from Martha's Vineyard in Napa Valley from Tom May. And to this time now, they're still buying the grapes from Tom May and Martha's Vineyard. And what makes Martha's Vineyard so unique is there's eucalyptus trees on the vineyard. And somehow, some way, the eucalyptus gets into the wine. And some vintages is pretty pronounced, the mintiness. And sometimes it's over the top and it needs time to age out, but it adds that distinctiveness to it. Now, for many years, Heights, Martha's Vineyard, was the barometer for high quality Cabernet for decades. And the 1968 was considered to be the greatest wine California ever made at the time. I don't know if I agree with that, but it is a great wine. And, and 1970 was outstanding, 74, 78, uh, very consistent. Uh, and he has made wines uh, in a very, very balanced style. And Lately, they've been using a little more oak. Uh, there's a little more alcohol in the wines, but still, it's very, very classic. So for all these decades, and the wines age magnificently. The next wine is Diamond Creek. As you see, this wine is only in a 750. The rest are in magnums. Uh, I do have a three liter of this, and I'm sure I have a few magnums. I just couldn't come across them. But in 1968, Al Bronstein uh, bought 55, uh, bought, um, he bought three vineyards, four vineyards, uh, four distinct vineyards. He bought seven acres, um, Red Rock Terrace Vineyard, uh, eight acres, Volcanic Hill, uh, five acres of Gravelly Meadow, and less than one acre of the Lake Vineyard. And all four of those have very distinct soils and make very, very different wines. So what Al Bronstein did was he had very, he was the first one to have a state bottled single vineyard wines that he owned and he grew and he bottled individually. And he was a real, uh, he, that's really Chateau bottled wine. If you really think about it, that it's grown there and it's made there. And only those grapes from that vineyard are there. And each one is different. Red Rock Terrace, uh, is rich in iron, uh, and, and, uh, and is soft, softer than Volcanic Hill, which obviously has volcanic soil and the wines are more tannic. 
uh, and, and age very well. Gravelly Meadow, uh, obviously with Dora Gravelly Meadow, it has gravel in it, drains very well. Uh, the wines are elegant and, and more fine. Uh, and Lake is under an acre, so it's not produced every year. And it's maybe produced one out of every five vintages, one out of every ten. And, and the wines are very elegant. And when they're not used just for a lake designation, they're used in the other wines. So what he did, he really started Chateau Bottling uh, in California, the same rules. And uh, in, in 2020, the people who are controlling shareholders of Road River Champagne bought Diamond Creek and They've been friends with, Al, with the Bronstein family for many years, so the wines are going to, you know, just going to continue. Then we have Maya Camas. In 1968, Bill Travers uh, bought 55 acres of uh, land in Mount Beter, um, 18 to 2,400 feet up above in Napa Valley. And what makes these wines unique is he ages these wines in concrete vats, in large concrete vats, and very little new wood. Uh, and these wines age very, very well, and they're very elegant, very, very elegant. Uh, and never overwooded, never too dark in color, and classic vintages of this were, were uh, 1968, 1970, 73, 74, 78, and so on. And these wines live on, now there was a period of mediocrity, or Parker had said about the wines that they're too skinny and they don't have enough body, uh, they don't have enough oomph. That's when the California wines were really pumping up the style and that was the taste. Maya Camas never went that way. And, and to this day, they age phenomenally and very, very classic. Now, the last wine, and which is my pick as my favorite wine, is Ridge Montebello. Now, all these other wines are Napa Valley wines. And Napa Valley is known for ripeness. Uh, uh, Napa is the valley of the sun. You know, and, and it's very warm. And it's not hard to get big, plump wines. Uh, but Ridge is in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And it's about 15 miles off the Pacific Ocean. So you get those cooling breezes at night. And it's up, it's up about 2,600 feet, the Montebello Estate. Uh, and it was bought in 1962, but the key thing, what happened was in 1969, Paul Draper joined as winemaker. And from that point on, one wine after another from Ridge, it just continued to produce excellent to great wines. And I've had many of these wines. I have a, I probably have 25 cases in my cellar of different vintages of Ridge. Uh, I have a vertical of three liter bottles of 13 vintages in a row of Ridge Montebello. That's how much I like them. Uh, and, and, and what makes Ridge different is what Draper did is he had hands off approach in winemaking. And uh, he let the Santa Cruz mountain range speak for itself. Uh, and the key thing about Ridge and about Montebello is has a lot of limestone in the soil and that gives the wines minerality and it gives elegance to the wines and Napa Valley you don't see limestone around too much uh, but it makes a big difference in the Santa Cruz mountains having that limestone and um, over the years they were brought out by a Japanese pharmaceutical company, but they'd left them alone. And they just gave them capital and they kept investing in vineyards and they kept. Now, the Montebello estate itself consists of four different vineyards. 
And on the bottom is Klein. On the top, I think it's the Tory uh, Vineyard. And there's, I said Klein at the bottom. There's Roasting. And there's another one. I just can't think on the top of my head. But the ones that are on top go into Montebello. And the ones on the bottom that are softer or younger vines go into the estate bottling. Now, the average price for a Ridge Montebello 750 retail is about 250 now. And the estate is about 65. So it's like a third to 25% of the price of the Montebello. And those ones are good. Those wines taste a lot like the Montebello does, except they're not as tannic, not as rich, and don't see as much wood. And these wines age forever. And I've never had a mediocre Ridge Montebello. It was either outstanding or it was great. And if you really want to taste California, now, as I said, this is Santa Cruz mountain range. It's not Napa. But this is my favorite, and I want to know what you think. Will you agree or disagree? And hopefully you understand a long history of California and some of the greatest wines right here of California.